Drake, good to have you here. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much. And congratulations on this new baby of, the, of yours, this record. Uh, universal acclaim. It's getting critical acclaim. Debuted at the top of the Billboard charts. How does that feel this time, really? Honestly, it's, it's more than I could ever ask for, you know? Um, this particular album was <clears throat> not only... Um, uh, a ch uh, not only a challenge coming off of, you know, Take Care, which um, received a lot of positive feedback, and I was obviously awarded uh, a Grammy, which I had been waiting for for a long, long time uh, in my life, was one of my, my main goals. Um, but not only that, my right-hand partner in, in music creation challenged me on this album to um, trim the fat, you know, to make a very concise project. and asked me to, it actually gave me a, a song cap, you know, asked me to keep it at uh, like 13 or 14 songs on the original. Um, and so that was, that was an interesting challenge for me. And now that it's out and the world appreciates it, it's, it's a great feeling. And you took a long time to write, to make this record. Yeah. It took was there a specific vision? Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to tell more of the story. Um, that was one thing that, you know, another person I know whose opinion I respect very much, I asked them, you know, what's next? What comes next? What, 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 what would you want to hear from me? And they said to me, um, you know, I want to hear you tell, give me more of the story. Like, you know, I know great things about you that other people don't know, whether it's, you know, with family, with women, with just, just give me more of your story. Uh, get more personal. More personal. More personal, yeah. Um, and I think I pushed it to its max on, on this record. Um, I don't know if there is another step to take after this. I think I'm going to figure out what's next for me, but there is another evolution for Drake after this, you know, definitely. I don't know if it's going, I don't think it's going further. I think I, you know, I'm going to make whatever adjustment I end up making. You know, I, I always like to grow. Um, I, I always like to grow every record, but I always like to sort of change direction a bit. So with this, it's, it, it, it's a lot more, you know, it's a lot more aggressive. It's a lot more confident. And um, the reflections, I think, are a lot clearer. They're a lot more accurate. So I'm telling stories with details that maybe, you know, I was so caught up while I was making Take Care. Maybe I didn't remember these little small details that make, you know, make you really able to relate to the song. Let me ask you about the details. In fact, you've said a lot there that I want to come back to, uh, the aggression, uh, the evolution. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the details, uh, you've said at one point that you'd work on lyrics for one song at a time on this record for three weeks at a time. Yeah. What... What's happening in those three weeks? What are you working on? Um, I'm, sometimes I'm working and sometimes I'm just waiting. Um, I, I write about my life. I don't write uh, stories. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of classic rap is um, storytelling, but it's storytelling about someone else. Um, fictional stories sometimes. Um, I can't do that. I have to write about my life. So... Sometimes in order to complete a verse the way I want to or to finish a second verse on a song when I've already done the first one, I have to allow myself to either live a portion of life that I haven't lived yet or um, something has to set in, you know, when it does take a week, two weeks, three weeks. Sometimes it's taking longer than that. I mean, I, I have a song that I still can't figure out um, the hook for it because, you know, I've just... And why do you keep it in the bullpen? I mean, there's that famous cliche, I think uh, Elton John, but a few people have said it, where uh, my best songs I've written in 10 minutes, uh -huh. you know? Um, so, a so lot of my hit songs I've written in, in, in a very short period of time, you know, um, Hold On, We're Going Home, I felt like we finished that in like two hours. Hmm. Um, and some other... So why do you keep records. the faith in a song that you've been working on for weeks? I, I'm, not, I'm not a guy that does 40 songs for a project and picks 13 of them. Hmm. Um, I have, if I'm going to go as far as to track uh, over a beat, I usually, I usually have the utmost faith in it that it'll end up somewhere. Um, I, I don't really dispose of too many songs... Uh, I have stuff that didn't make this album, definitely. Um, but I don't have 20 or 30 of them. You know, I have four or five records that just didn't make it because, again, I was trying to keep it concise. And whatever I end up doing with those, I'll, I'll do with them. But There's a fluidity on this record, a continuation of, what, of your style of what you do between the rapping and the singing. Mm -hmm. And 
many people have made the have made the case that that didn't really exist in the norm, at least at, at a major le- uh, level, before you. Uh, it, has that become the norm for you? I think that with this particular album, what I tried to do was find the perfect balance between rapping and melody. I love melody. I sing. That's what I do. I've been very open about that. You know, um, I caught a lot of scrutiny on the last record because there were distinct singing moments. There were borderline ballad moments. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that as important as that was for that period of time for me, you know, I love that music. I love that, that album. And it was, it was important for me to make. What I tried to do with this album was blur the lines so that even when I am singing, it just doesn't feel like singing. And even when I'm rapping, the cadences are almost melodic to the point that they stick in your head. And I remember I, I brought this, uh, this older gentleman in to recut a, a baseball sample for me on the beginning of Connect. And, um, and he said, uh, he was listening to the song and he's like, he's like, so what are you gonna call this? I was like, the song? And he's like, no, this genre of music that you're creating. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's, that's, uh, that's really kind of you to say. But I mean, it, it did open my eyes to the fact that, you know, I was able to sort of um, make it gray, which I want. You're wanted. not afraid of melody. Not at all. You're not afraid of sweet melodies. Is anything too sugary for you? I mean, is there a point where you go, where a lot of artists would go, I can't do that. That's just, that's just too, uh, that's too sweet a melody. Um, I, 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 I do shy away from major, like major chords and major chord progressions. Uh, those are the classic, like, you know, pop, um, they, those aren't the melodies that hit you in your heart. Yeah, you, you know, want to for pay me, those. it's minor for me. It's, 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 it's 40 produces in minor and I'll find the melodies to sort of f- slip around it, you know, um, I, is, is, is anything too sugary? <laughs> um, it just has to have emotion behind it. You know, um, hold on, we're going home at the end of the day is, is, is a very, uh, I mean, that, that is a major song, you know, um, but it, there's emotion there, you know, there's, there's, there's points where you're really, you, you, you feel something and that, that's, that's all that matters to me, you know, as long, as long as it penetrates. There's interesting juxtapositions on this record because you've talked about, uh, this album being about feeling good about where you're at. Right. Uh, and yet the music doesn't always feel uniformly celebratory. It can feel pretty downbeat. Right. Uh, tell me about that discrepancy. Well, is what, there, there's, there's a victorious sentiment behind it, you know? I, I think the most important thing to understand about this record is the sentiment. You know, I'm, I'm 26, working as hard as I possibly can with my friends that I grew up with, making my family happy. You know, uh, I'm so sick of people saying that, uh, that I'm like, lonely and emotional and like associating me with this like longing for a woman or sad guy yeah Yeah. i hate that man it bothers me so much because i don't make you know like i I do make i do make music that makes you feel something but you know i I just don't like i'm actually not that guy in real life i'm very happy you know i'm very i'm 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 not content by any means i mean i want to keep working but i'm a happy person you know i'm very excited my life is my life is constantly exciting it's not some sad depressing story so um as far as the soundscapes go that's just the music that i choose to make man I'm, i make my music strictly for the purpose of like driving at nighttime you know that's why that's, that's what i make my music what for. about the aggressive thing you said this is a more aggressive record some people have call, talked about the confrontational lyrics even even the the record starts off with tuscan leather it's a, mm-hmm. a pretty hard old school yeah. rap song um uh, you know there's a superficial reading of the confrontational part of this record that says this guy's doing so well just what you described, mm-hmm. but even more, the material success, mm-hmm. the number one record, all that. What's he got to be confrontational and aggressive about? <laughs> um, that's just kind of the nature of, of, of rap and hip hop music. People have to understand that, you know, it's a very unique genre in that regard. That um, Confrontation is inherent in the art form? I believe so, yeah. Competition is, is, is inherent in the, in the art form. Um, confrontation just kind of comes with the territory and there's something to be said for um, the fact that, you know, a lot of people talk that talk and, and 
you know, just do it because that's what hip hop is about. Well, I'm going to talk and I'm going to talk like I'm the biggest dog, but I'm not. I'm actually the one guy, the young guy, the one young guy that can really step up to the plate and talk my game. And you, I check out, you know, if you, if you choose to go and research, I check out. So that was one thing that I understood on this record. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to play this humble, um, you know, sort of shy, like new guy, like happy to be here role this time around. You know, I put in enough work and I plan to put on, put, put in as, as, as much as I need to moving forward. Um, and I want to, I want to make that known, you know, I'm here. Let me come back to that in terms mm -hmm. of the, 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 the being clear and honest about where you want to go and, and what you are. But, uh, just in the, the part about the aggression being part of rap, it's interesting, right? Because to a certain extent, forgive the pun, it gets a bad rap that mm -hmm. why is this music so aggressive? And yet the metaphor, it works. I mean, you wouldn't think of hard rock music as, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise that it needs to be aggressive to work, right. both in terms of the way it's presented and in terms of the lyrical content. So it's still, there's still an education that has to happen around hip hop and rap, would you say? I think that there's something to be said for the fact that everybody wants to be the guy with the juice. Everybody wants to be the best. Um, and because we're, we're doing um, a, a form of music where it's, it's complete self-expression, a lot of it has to do with talking about yourself. Uh, whereas there's other genres where it's like, you know, of course, you know, that maybe this rock group wants to be better than this rock group, but their rock albums aren't about the genre of music that they're in or, you know, what's been happening. You know, rap is like you use rap to update people on your life. At least I do. You know, my music is an update. I, I don't want to talk to you on, on social media. and Your, you your know. songs are status updates. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I mean, because I don't like what we're doing right now. I mean, and I'm honored to be here. And I love, I love the fact that I'm here. You know, I'm a proud Canadian, so I'm happy that I'm here. But I don't want to do this all the time because, you know, I'd rather express what I have to say in, on the album. I don't necessarily want to just talk through everything. And with that being said, you know, I think that's where a lot of the, the, the confrontation stems from in our genre because, you know, in the times where I'll make a record and then go away, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things, try and state their claim or, you know, when, 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 you're, not, when you're not on an album cycle, there's going to be someone else that is that wants that spot. So you have to come back with a vengeance always, you know. Do you? I like to. I mean, I'm here to you, win. You... You're here to win. Yeah, 100%. It, you like the competitive. Yeah. You I don't mean, feel like that's just what the way it has to be. You want it to be that way. You well, want to win. Yeah, I've, I've functioned best under... I've always functioned... I mean, I was the kid that um, that used to not study for his test, like, uh, unless it was like a night before. I, I, I functioned best under pressure, one. Uh, and the thing that's changed about that is I never really used to pass my test back in the day. But I feel like I'm passing <laughs> you're passing it in a big way now. <laughs> what about the flip side to the aggression? I mean, on this record, that you're as open as you ever were about your emotions and vulnerabilities. And you've been credited, Drake, as you know, with opening up the range of what rappers talk about in, in mainstream rap, especially. How did you resist adopting a harder posture in the beginning when that was the norm? I, well, the, when, I, when I first came in and started rapping, um, I wasn't really, it, it was sort of a change over time. You know, it was, there were more options, I think, for, for rappers. Like, uh, being hard wasn't necessarily, it was kind of like, it was there. It was, it's, it's always going to be there in, in rap music. You know, um, people say like, you know, like gangster rap is now trap music. You know, it's it's, it's, it's always going to be there. Drugs, uh, you know, G, G rap, all that. It's, it's, it's always going to be alive. It's just that um, there w I came in at a time where I came in at a, I, I came in at the perfect time for myself, which was I, I didn't need to be something I wasn't. And I made a commitment very early on to just be myself, you know. And what really bothers me the most is the fact that, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, I don't get enough credit or I'm not making 
a big enough impact because I'm not enough of a loose cannon, you know, in situations like this where we're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview or, you know, that people just want me to go off more and lose my composure. And then that way, you know, I guess maybe I would be like, Cooler. make more headlines or be more iconic, but that's not me. You know, I, I may, I, I'm, I'm a naturally poised individual. Uh, I don't want to just come out, you know, making mistakes right. and having to be like, oh, man, but you've also have. said that one of the biggest misconceptions about you is that any part of you wants to be gangster or hood. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Well, what are people reacting to when they have that misconception about you? Do you think? I think it's just a lack of knowledge. You know, I think maybe they've only heard one song or seen one clip or listened to one friend and um, decide to form an opinion just based off that. You know, I've never really, I don't think, done anything that would, you know, make someone say, oh, he wants to be gangster, or, oh, he's trying to, the only thing I've done is become a rapper from a TV show, you know, but that's not like, that, that's just, I, I was rapping while I was on that show. I always wanted to do this. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I stand by that quote. I don't, I don't want that. You know, I don't, I don't, th that comes with pressures. Nobody, nobody should ever want that, by the way. You know, that comes with, with stress that you could never imagine. You mean to be something they're not? To be something you're not and to be that specifically. I mean, that comes with problems that I don't think anybody really wants. Is to that handle. still a, a, something in the, in the rap world and the hip hop world? The, the idea that you need to be hood, you need to be from the hood. Is that some sort of, um, still some sort of status? Yeah, I, th I think I think that there's, like I said, there's always going to be an appeal there um, as far as, you know, listening to people rap about, um, you know, killings and drugs and all that stuff. Like, it, it's just, I, I always say when I'm in the studio, I'm always like, when I'm writing a rap, I'm like, man, if I could just throw a gun bar in here, I would be like, this thing would be done. And I feel that way, you know, sometimes it's just such an easy scapegoat, like, right. You know, you just, I can't rap about that. You know, you have to understand when I'm finishing these albums, remember there's a lot of things that are um, off limits to me. And it's not because someone told me they're off limits to me. I just make them off limits to myself because I'm not gonna step out of my character just to finish a record. But you're such an interesting guy because there's, like there's a paradox that emerges when it comes to you, the, the two personalities of Drake, right? Mm -hmm. There's this confident guy who has bravado, who wants to win, who is number one and wants to be number one and, and carries himself with that kind of confidence. And then there's the vulnerable, emotive guy who almost converge on insecure at times. Mm -hmm. Do you see that paradox in yourself? Yeah, I, I think that I'm, I'm just a, a human being that, that's willing to show you that I'm human, you know. Um, I don't know if it's a paradox or if it's like some rare character trait. It's just that a lot of people um, will only show you the confident side, especially in music, because the vulnerable side is like, I would like, they don't want to go there. You know, I'm okay with going there. I, that, that, that to me is supreme confidence. The fact that I could express, you know, the issues that I'm having um, with family, with women or with self, you know, the fact that I, the fact that I can express that is to me the ultimate confidence. So. Nicely said. Um, I want to talk more about this new record, but first take us back and, and where this all comes from, where, where music came from. Your, your father's a musician. Mm -hmm. he's, he's talked about having you on his lap and playing piano with you yeah. when you were a kid. Do you remember those times? Yeah, I remember. Um, I mean, I remember a lot of the early, early times from pictures, obviously, but there's definitely photographic evidence of, of my father, um, you know, having me around music. Um, and there's pictures of me performing with like a band when I'm like really, really young. What are you playing? In the I don't know. Oh, I'm singing. <laughs> singing. I have the mic stand. Right. Yeah. And I have sunglasses on, which is weird because <laughs> I never wear sunglasses but, um, um, when I'm performing. I mean, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I remember definitely being around music when I was younger. My dad used to gig around the city. Um, and when he used to have me, when it was his time to, you know, my, cause my parents are, my parents are divorced. So when he, when he used to have his time with me, um, he used to very much against my mother's will take me to his gigs, like at the bars when I was like, probably like six or seven years old. And I used to sit and watch him play. Um, and eventually he, <laughs> this is like really bad parenting, but, <laughs> but he integrated me in his act. Uh, like, so I would come up and sing this song, Ride Sally Ride, 
Um, but I was like, you know, just a little guy. Um, but I used to come up on stage and sing with my dad. Like Mustang Sally? Mustang Rad Sally, yeah. Sally yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so, so do you remember, was there a moment in, in all of that where you thought this could be my career path? Or was this just, you're just having fun with, with dad? And so, I mean, did, was there a click that happened at, at an, uh, an early age where you thought this, this is something I might want to pursue? I wouldn't say that, that early. I mean, I was really, really young when I was doing that. But um, definitely when I started to get into my teens is when I started to take an interest in becoming a musician. Um, you know, I remember initially I was like thinking of being a DJ, you know, I went to play the record and uh, bought like some turntables and some records and, um, you know, I thought that would be kind of like maybe a moment for me and that was maybe like at the beginning, very beginning of high school, you know, um, but I was always making music, you know, I was always, uh, I had, you know, instrumentals and was always kind of rapping um, rapping over these beats that I could find. I think off the time you would have to get your in instrumentals off like Napster or something. You know, I was, I was, I was always interested in making the music. Um, Two steps back. Yeah. Your, your parents divorced when you were a kid. You grew up in Toronto while your dad lived in Memphis. Yes. What was it like going back between Toronto and Memphis for you? It was pivotal to me in, in, in shaping the man that I am today. I think that, um, Going to Memphis gave me a glimpse into, you know, what, what rap, what rap really felt like for me, um, because I got to go and be around. I was I was around Yo Gotti back when you know Yo, Yo Gotti is a rapper from Memphis. I was around Yo Gotti like in the very early stages, and it was only because. Uh, my cousin's baby father used to like manage him or work with him. So he used to bring me around a crazy lifestyle that I knew nothing about being being from here. You know, I mean, it was just it was surreal. It seemed so big. I mean, the club seemed so glamorous. The, and it, it was Memphis, Tennessee, so it probably wasn't that glamorous at the time. But, you know, the cars just seemed so expensive. And, you know, these guys were like drinking like Louis the 13th and just like doing things. I was just like my mind was blown. I was so young and it was like I got to see not only rap culture, but like Southern rap culture, which is very influential. And it opened up it opened up not only my mind, but my ears. I started listening to, you know, what, like, okay, well, if Yo Gotti isn't the originator, then okay, well, what, what about 8-Ball and MJG? What about 3-6 Mafia? And then I started shifting my focus to Houston and listening to, like, Houston music, you know, which now has a very, very, very large influence on the music that I make. And what did Toronto represent for you at the time? I mean, I, obviously it was home, but you grew up in a fairly white neighborhood. You're this biracial kid. Did you fit in? Did you feel like you fit in? I actually, this is another thing that really bothers me too. I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up in a in a white neighborhood. I grew up on Weston Road. Um, I went to I went to Weston. I went to Weston Collegiate. Uh, I went to CR and I went to West. No, sorry, I went to Weston Memorial. I went to Weston Collegiate for summer school, which is bad because that means I failed. But um, I, I grew up. I grew up uh, like on Weston Road for a lot of my life. Um, and I only moved to Forest Hill because my mother is an incredible woman who was willing to live beyond, far beyond her means for the sake of her family. Um, we rented a, someone's basement and the first floor. I didn't have some mansion. I wasn't, you know, I, I grew up with a mother that was deep in debt because she wanted the best for her family. So, um... Being biracial was obviously tougher in, in Forest Hill than it was, you know, in the west end of the city. But um, but I, I sort of made I made made friends as I, as I could, you know, um, and I, I had a tough time, definitely had a tough time. I think I really started to find myself when I switched over and went to when I got when I got on Degrassi. I mean, I'll never forget the day I got the phone call that I didn't have to go back to Forest Hill. Um, for another year of high school, but I had to start high school all over again because I was going to Vaughn Road program for, you know, kids with outside commitments. I didn't even care about doing the ninth grade over again. Right. I was just ready to leave. There. But it sounds like, I mean, just so I get this right, um, it, was, it was almost worse than the way I described it. So you, you grew up in a more integrated place, and then you, when you transferred into Forest Hill, yeah. you suddenly, or you start to feel 
like you don't fit in? Well, when kids are young, you know, sometimes um, you can't fault them for the um, the way that they choose to alienate some kids or uh, the things that come out of their mouth. You know, kids say the darndest things. Um, I, I hold no resentment for um, anybody that, you know, gave me a hard time. But I, I definitely had, I didn't have an easy time. Well, know? there's, there's a, on your new album, there's a line that goes, thinking back on how they treated me, uh, my high school reunion might be worth an appearance, make everybody have to go through <laughs> security clearance. Well, yeah, I mean, like is, my, that, is that a little like, revenge fantasy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just like my way of making a joke about it. You know, like I said, I hold no real real resentment about it. But, you know, I, I did want to mention it because it, it, it is something, there is something to be said for the fact that I bump into people now and they're always like, yo, man, <laughs> Joe, it's good to see you, man. We should go out for a drink. And you're like, time. wait a minute. I'm just like, really? That's interesting. Aren't but, you the guy that, yeah. in gym class? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was actually girls that gave me a harder time than, than, than guys. You know, I had some cool friends. I had some cool friends as far as guys go. There were a couple kids that, you know, if I saw them outside a show, I don't know if I'd get them in, you know, as far as guys go. But, How would girls uh, give you a hard time? Um, girls are just mean, you know, girls are mean. They're just mean people when they're young, you know. So it was just like, it was very, um, you know, obviously like predominantly white, you know, uh, all Jewish school. So it was kind of difficult for young kids to understand how I was like black but Jewish. But, you know, it wasn't, I mean, there was just... Um, established families, cliques, cliques, I guess the cl is cliquey, you know, um, it was, it was just tough to find people with an open mind that weren't, you know, a little, a little mean, but I'm sure that that's a lot of people's experience. You're known as a good looking guy now. You're a heartthrob now. Uh, did, thank well, you. I, I mean, <laughs> I I, 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 you, don't, you don't have any trouble in that area. <laughs> did you, did you think of yourself as a good looking kid when you were, I mean, did you, I, I, I didn't really like, again, you know, I started with girls. I started with girls late because of the atmosphere that I was in. You know, uh, when I broke away from when I broke away from that mentality of, yeah, always feeling like sort of this guy that, again, is just like happy to be here. You guys want to invite me somewhere like I'm just happy to go because I got an invite. Um, when I broke away from that and started really finding myself is also where I, where I found myself with women. You know? so, so you get was, into your teen years. Yeah. You, you become well-known as an actor on Degrassi, mm -hmm. the, uh, the next generation. Around the same time, you're also starting to get involved in music. Did you know at that point which one you wanted more, actor, yeah. musician? Yeah, I, I knew right away. Um, and it had a lot to do with the, the process of, of acting. It's just so dependent on so many other things other than yourself. It's takes a long time for you to actually get on set and do what you love. You know, you got to find an agent. Your agent has to be good. He has to get you or he or she has to get you auditions. Then you got to go to the auditions. Then you got to get a call back. Then there's, you know, the project has to get green lit and this, that and the third. It's just so many things that that have to happen before you get to do what you love. And with music, um, thank God I found 40 and we became you know, the most self-contained operation you could possibly ask for. I mean, I literally make the music, you record it. You control the means of your own production. Exactly. And there's a great story how you get seduced into rap. I, I don't know if your father, I mean, your father had had some run-ins with the law and was, mm -hmm. and actually did a stint in prison when mm -hmm. you were a kid. And I read somewhere that part of your tutelage in rap came from a rapper who called himself Poverty, mm -hmm, yeah. who was a cellmate of your father's. Yeah. Tell me that story. Um, well, my dad was locked up with this guy and I don't know where he is now. Uh, I never, I never got a chance to speak to him again. But uh, he didn't have anybody to call. You know, he didn't have any like family or anybody to speak to. So my dad used to share uh, his phone time with this guy, and this guy used to rap. So he used to read me his raps over the phone, and. I told him, you know, I, I rap too. So we used to kind of, I used to be like, it got to the point where I'd be like, yeah, dad, all right, cool. Where, where's, where, you know, where's he at? Uh, like, I got new raps to, I got new raps to get, uh, spit for him or whatever. So we used to kind of use the remainder of my dad's phone time and just rap, rap and rap until it cut off. It's kind of a beautiful story. Yeah, it's... it's, it's you don't it's, know where he is now? I don't. No, I don't. I know it would be crazy to sit down with him one day. I'm not sure. I, don't, I never knew his real name or anything, but, um, but yeah, he definitely 
gets a lot of credit in those in those early years. Drake, sure. what was the what was the moment where you finally decide to pursue music, hip hop, rap in a serious way? Um, I pretty much, for lack of a better term, we we all kind of got laid off of Degrassi. Um, I mean, it was. It was it was it was a upsetting time for me, you know. We all kind of came in. The names on our dressing rooms were changed. You know, they were making a complete changeover. They were starting over with new younger kids. Um, there was really nowhere for us to go, even though we thought maybe we, would you know, expand and go to university or something. I don't know, but um, I don't know what we thought. But <laughs> uh, a lot of us, a lot of the main characters, um, got sort of exed off the show, and. From there, I, I was just like, I remember telling my mom that I was going to tell my agent that I'm going to probably take a break and see where this music thing takes me, and I want to dedicate my time to it. I was already, I was already getting in trouble for 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 um, spending more time on music and showing up to work tired. You know, um, I used to record in Scarborough, and. I had like kind of my relationships at Degrassi were so good that I would come in at 5 a.m. <laughs> and go to sleep on the floor in my dressing room and, you know, tell one of the ADs or somebody, like, just wake me up, you know, I'll, I'll be in my room. So I used to get four hours of sleep. My call time would be like 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And I would sleep on the floor until I had to be up for work. But I, I used to basically live right. like on the floor in my dressing room. That had nothing so to do live. with laying you off. Yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah. That's Can probably, we get rid of the guy yeah, sleeping on the floor? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but so you decide to take this music path. And, it, and, you know, in the bigger scope of things, it doesn't take that long before you blow up in the United States. But in the, in the first, in the early moments when you're, when you're pursuing this, what was the response you get as a Canadian black Jewish rapper uh, trying to get attention in the U.S.? I think the details of my my like background kind of came afterwards. I think what caught first was the music. And I think what became almost more appealing was like this is the guy that I remember those moments from people like wait wait wait. This guy is this guy? Like people really, you know, drawing the the connection um and I always say I, I wouldn't have it any other way, man. I wouldn't have it any other way because I, I truly don't know if I'd be here if I didn't have so much to potentially overcome as pe some people may look at it. I mean, to you me, don't I, look at it that way. Not really, because, uh, you know, I'm from Toronto. I'm from a place where it's a true mosaic. You know, there's we're we're we're, we're to me the most open minded place you can possibly find yourself. So I don't ever look at it as that, you know, but. There are other places that you go where it's just not so it's it's not that simple, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I, I never looked at it as overcoming anything. I was just like, man, I just got to be a good rapper. But, you know, to a lot of other people, they were like, wait, what, wait, 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 what? You're Canadian, you're Jewish and you're half, you know, it's just like mind blowing things to them. Um, but like I said, yeah, I don't think that. You know, it wasn't like on my mixtape cover. It just said like the new Canadian half black Jewish. Like I, it wasn't like advertised. <laughs> so people had, to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people yeah. had to go kind of find out about me. And I think when they did, it made the story even more interesting. I, I, like I said, I, I wouldn't want that to change. At you all. you you pursue things sort of independently through social media, MySpace. Um, th things grow. You quickly become known as being a personal confessional songwriter. Some mm -hmm. of what we've talked about, uh, and you become even more so uh, on this rock record. You talk about painful experiences with your family. You mentioned mm -hmm. women you've dated by name. Mm -hmm. um, why is it important? I know you want to be real. Uh, so we get, we get that part, but why is it important to open up as much as you do in your lyrics? Well, like I said, I, I have a really tough time um, going, one, going halfway with things, you know, um, telling stories in a general manner. They just don't connect the same way to me. Um, my goal, my goal a lot of the time when I'm making a body of work, sometimes when I'm doing a feature verse, my goal is just to like have fun, 
you know, show you that I'm here, that I can rap really well. When I'm doing a body of work, my, my, my goal is to let you know more and more about me um, and to let you know that I'm a real person, uh, to let you know that I'm not afraid of my, my past, you know? Um, I, like, and I've said this, and I, and I, 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 I don't want to be repetitive, but there is something to be said for the fact that I get to wake up every day and I don't have to think about anything. I just get to go and be myself. Mm. I don't have to remember to do this or dress like this or put on this accent or, you know, I just get to wake up and be myself. And is it ever storytelling? Is the guy in the song? I mean, earlier you said something that sort of alluded to, yeah, well, that's what I'm in the song. I'm in the lyrics. I mean, is the Drake in the, in, in the lyrics always the you? Yeah, 100%. Um, always me. There's no, I don't really exaggerate. Um, it's not an amped up character. It's not. No, it's just how I feel inside. You know, of course, my, my, my feelings inside are always going to be amped up. You know, like I said, I was taught by a phenomenal woman, my mother, how to conduct myself on a day to day basis. So the person that you meet is always, or I mean, hopefully I'm always going to be somebody who's, you know, uh, a pleasant to deal with mm. but inside I have a lot of you know I feel I feel a way about a lot of things and, right? and the people that you write about how do they feel about being exposed um <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 very careful with that as as you know you use a word they're exposed you know um I, I I never want it to feel like exposed because I don't do it with malicious intent and and exposed feels malicious to me mm. there's no malice involved it's it's stories that i feel the need to tell for my own soul and for for other people to sort of again draw parallels with me um as far as the people go you know i always i always double check i always try and you know send the song and be like yo i just want to make sure that this isn't too much and then sometimes, you know, for example, like on this record, sometimes it's 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 not too much until it's out, mm. you know, which is tough for people because it just gets bigger than any of us can ever imagine sometimes. And that's what happened. There's a theory. You've been called a product of your generation because your confessional work has a parallel with the, pe the way people open up online about their lives and social media and on the Internet. Do mm -hmm. you see it that way? Um... I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not uh, echoing any social, like, I, 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 I hate, I hate the gist of, of, of living your life on the internet and telling everybody um, personal details about yourself on social media. So I, I don't think it has anything. That one to, doesn't work for you. No, I don't. Like that. <laughs> um, yeah, th I, I find music a lot more, uh, it's a useful tool. It's, it's. It's, it's inspirational. I, I want people to use it as a life soundtrack, as a guide, you know? Um, and not so much as a guide who's like, don't make the same mistakes I did. Just, just there's someone else out there that's like living a real life and here it is, you know? And maybe you find some, some things in there that, you know, let you be able to say, I'm not the only one, you know? Cause I felt like I was the only one until I heard that. And that's what gets me, man. That's what really does it for me is when people come to me and say, like, oh, I was having a tough time, man. I got this. And it's like I use it as an actual tool. It's not just a CD that comes on and goes off. I use it. Um, and that I mean, it's a cliche, but meaning it's like therapy. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's 100%. catharsis. Yeah. I mean. And I can't expect that reaction every time. You know, to some people, it'll just be music, and that's fine, too, as long as, it, you know, if it makes you happy, that's good. That's still therapy in its own way. If you party to it, that's, that's it's just, it's, it's all just a tool, you know? And to me, social media is like um, a tool, but it, it can also lead to destruction. I mean, you, 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 a lot of people I know become dependent on it. And... It makes everybody feel famous. I mean, you have followers, which equate to fans who are actually, you feel are actually interested in every single move. And 
you know, it's 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 crazy, man. What's going on in our generation? It really is. It it, it bothers me sometimes. I want to ask you about. I know I can't keep you here forever. I want to ask you about Canada. I want to ask you about Toronto. Mm-hmm. Very quickly, though, you've talked a lot about Marvin Gaye's uh, late '70s album "Here, My Dear" as yeah. being a big inspiration for for your work. That's a very confessional record about mm-hmm. about a painful divorce. Yes. What was it about that record that inspired your own, and what is it about Mar- Marvin Gaye that you want people to know? Well, I've I've been inspired by Marvin Gaye in in in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, one is that I, I util- use his recording space to make some of my music. So that was kind of the initial the initial point for me where I was, you know, looking around at all these images and just the the environment and it made me say, "Okay, let me I want to go deeper into this guy's career, I started listening to uh, a lot more Marvin Gaye music than I ever had before, um, even though my father would play it. But still, um, I started listening, you know, to the way that he layers his vocals. You know, it's almost like there's two songs going on. He's got, you know, this 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 ad lib track that's so well placed. It was like, and I use that a lot on on this album. Just just well placed little mm. touches and ad libs in the background that add energy. But they're not, you know, they're not lyrics that you're gonna sing out. But they're important, you know, as far as like fluidity and just the flow of it. Um, Here, my dear, here, my dear, became important to me um, because of the storytelling without using any literal. Like, you know, to tell a story through music and not skits, to tell a story through music and not music videos. It was like such a clear story and it was only using the songs. And I felt like nobody had had done that in a while. Um, I know that there have been, you know, great, great albums that involve, you know, little pieces. and the. But I wanted to make it like a clear cut story, a concise story, only using the songs. And that's a tough task. Um, and, you know, I remember there was a point on the album where he talks about um, the lawyer, about something, the fact that he mentioned like his lawyer in one of the songs or like lawyer fees or something like, I was just like, this is crazy. Like it's so vivid. Um, and about something so isolated, you know, a divorce. So. I, I try, again, this is more about my life. It's broader than that, but I, I did use his uh, tactics to, to make this record. Let me get back to your story and, and just the last few years. In, in, in 2007, 2008, really from 2006 on, you, you really blow up in the United States. And I, I know you're not going to, you're such a proud Canadian and you're from here and, and you're not going to speak of any malice with, when you speak about Canada, but it feels to a certain extent like Canada came late to the party. Do you feel that way? Um, when it comes to Drake? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say How that. How would you say it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that it, it took U.S. acceptance to create Canadian pride. I think that um, to break down those doors, to be, to start being mentioned with some names, it it almost became surreal um, for me and for a lot of people that I knew from home. And I remember just coming home with my initial like Little Wayne verses that I had on some of the first songs I had ever done and I was just blowing people away. They didn't understand it. They had never seen anything like it before. Um, and I think that as I kept, you know, moving forward, it just became, you know, something to be, and I would always bring it home. I would always bring it home, whether it was OVO Fest, whether it was, you know, coming out with Jay-Z, whether it was mentioning the city on, on, in songs and on, uh, in songs that were cool, that actually played on, you know, MTV and played in the clubs and in, in, in Live Miami, where people were saying the word Toronto. And like, it, it, it took that, it took me breaking down that door for, to, to be able to come home and, and, and give everybody a reason to be proud. And how do you feel about that? I'm okay with that. I mean... I mean, like on a mass level, you know, you, you've obviously had, there's fans of yours who are going to be watching this, listening to this, who mm-hmm. will say, I was there in the beginning. And, yeah, and they have been. Uh, and they I have don't been. want to describe But on, on, a, on a mass level, mm-hmm. 
Um, you know, there's some stuff that surprised us along the way. You, in, in 2011, you hosted Juno Awards. Yeah. You were great. Thanks. You killed as, as the host. You, were no, you had six nominations. Yeah. You didn't win one. Yeah. Not one. Yeah. I'm, how did moments like that feel? Mm, that was a tough night for me. Just because I put in a lot of work, you know, and I didn't understand it really. Um, I thought, like, at least in the rap category, I got to have this clinched, if not anything. But, I, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for the, the Junos. I don't know why they did that, you know. Um, uh, did I respect it? No, not really, you know. Um, but those are things I'm able to let go. Like, I'm, I'm not in it for, like, like uh, metal trophies that I could put up, like, on some shelf. That's not, like, why I'm doing it, you know. I'm doing Although you it. said you were excited about the Grammy. I will, of course I'm excited about a Grammy. I, that was my like dream to win. But I, at the same time, I'm not doing it. If I didn't win, it's not like I'd stop. Does criticism um, stick with you? I spoke to Paul Anka last year. He's a Canadian mm -hmm. icon. He talked about how hurt he was by a McLean's article criticizing him in the 1960s. Yeah. He remembers that. Yep. Does stuff like that stick with you? From certain, from certain publications, specifically ones from, from the city, yeah. I, I hate when... Um, like a publication described me as like, like or described OVO Fest as like an ego-driven festival. And I just thought like, wow. I mean, like I, it's the most selfless. I make no money that night. I spend all my money to bring all these this acts This is the big in. festival you do in, mm -hmm. in Toronto. Uh, yeah. A, a big hip hop festival yeah. where, and you've had all kinds of headliners from Jay-Z to Eminem to yep. Kanye turn up at it. Yeah, and I, I, I put all the money out myself to bring all those people in. I call in all my favors, and I do it solely for the city. I mean, um, like I said, I come away with, you know, nothing next to nothing after it because it's just such an expensive production to put on. And just, I, the, the, yeah, stuff like that hurts me for sure, but it, it only hurts me when, um, when it's from here. From Funny Toronto? Enough. Yeah. From Canada? Mm -hmm. From Toronto, specifically. Just because um, I, I always feel like when it comes to this city, I mean, I'm s so vocal about how much I care and I try and be as selfless as possible. I try and do as much as I can. Um, all I ever want to do is just see this city get the recognition and the love it deserves, see people from this city shine. You know, I put a lot of people in positions to do great things and I'm... I'm um, that's all I want to keep doing. It's actually funny talking about Toronto because um, the video for Start From The Bottom mm -hmm. shows you flying out of Toronto yeah. and then in an L.A. mansion. I mean, as much as you love it. Was it was the Dominican Republic, actually. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, was Toronto a kind of bottom then? No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. It's just like I wanted to end the video. I mean, my, my goal with that video was to shoot the majority of it in Toronto, but just end with like this vacation. I, I really just want to go on vacation, to be honest with you. So. It ends with you leaving <laughs> yeah, the city that you supposedly love so much. No, it's not, it's not, <laughs> that's not like some deep-rooted like <laughs> metaphor. I just wanted to take all my friends uh, away on a vacation at the end of the video, and I figured like, you know, we either go to the beaches or we go like uh, to an actual beach. So we went to... Went to an actual piece. You clearly have a lot of love for Toronto. Yes. Yeah, you, you have a tattoo of the area code four one six. What is it? When, when did that become a thing that you you know taking pride in and public being so public about Toronto? Well, I I remember a time in in Toronto rap where it was kind of like it was not cool to be like patriotic and we almost like you wanted to sound like just as far away from Toronto as possible just as you know as far as the lingo goes as far as uh, I, I mean I just remember when there was an extreme you know obsession with American culture and that was like where all the superstars were and all the rap was and I and by the I, way that generalizes as you know film yeah, you know, of course. Television. Of course. Yes, yes. Let's try and make Toronto look like New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but for me, I always was like, no, there's like things here that the world will will catch. Like even the area code always looked cool to me. You know, I was just like four one six. Like that's you know, it may sound crazy to somebody who's not from here, but it looks good on paper or like on the side of my like torso. You know, it looked like. Um, I just always was not only proud, but just fascinated with this city. Um, 
you know, with the, with the island influence that we have here, you know, with the way people talk, with the way people carry themselves, the little trends and the little things that, you know, I guess come with being young. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's like me, maybe, maybe it's only me and my friends that know about it, but you know, my Toronto that I grew up in was always what I wanted to put on the forefront if I ever got the chance and I did. Well, you've said Toronto is the reason you sound like you do. Yes. What does that sound like? That sounds like that and every other album that I've made. Um, because when I said to you that I make my music for driving at night, you know, the night drives that I went on th were, were through this city. So that was when I knew that my music was connecting, was when I used to get in my car and get, you know, on like on the highway and drive either out to the west or out to the east and it would be nighttime and I would be looking at this city and if the music matched that scenery then I was like it was it was it was right for me and I still do that the only difference is there's a security truck behind me now but, <laughs> but I still do it I still drive There's a security myself. truck? Yeah. You, you you require an entire truck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh well but it, it goes beyond pride for you, Drake. You 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 very prominently become a representative for Toronto. I mean, OVO alone, mm -hmm. you know, this is like you bring amazing artists every year to the OVO Fest, Stevie Wonder, Kanye West, TLC, Jay-Z, and, and, and we get a lot of attention. Toronto gets a lot of attention because of that. Mm -hmm. It becomes an international story, especially in the, in the music press, et cetera. Right. What do you see your role as when it comes to Toronto? Well, I'd like to just consider myself a messenger at this point, you know. Um, I really, I really want you to hear that album and know that that this city is is what inspired it. And if you like that album, and you're looking for a place to go, then you know come check out the city. You know there's great things here. It's, you know it's very diverse. There's great places to eat. There's great places to go. Um, and you know I'm I'm just I'm just really a messenger. I'm just giving you one guy's story from one city. Um, and as far as, you know, Toronto goes, I mean, I, I don't have like a, or nor do I need like an official title. I mean, I guess I do now as far as like the Raptors, the Raptors yeah, yeah, the Raptors thing goes, but, um, I've never, you know, I've never needed any like accolade or any pat on the back for what I do for the city. I, I really do it solely for the city. I, I don't, I don't want anything in, in return for but it. But when you become an ambassador for an entire genre of music for the city, um, your connection with the Raptors, your, I mean, even things as simple as just wearing Maple Leaf uh, yeah. jerseys or whatever when you're, when you're on prominent American TV shows. Right. Do, you, do you feel the weight of responsibility at some point? Like you, now you're, you're carrying the banner for us? I, I will say that all I ever, I, I just don't ever want to uh, embarrass us by making a mistake in, in my life. So, and that's something that goes even beyond the city. That's just for, for my own family, for my own career. I mean, I just want to never make any, you know, stupid decisions that, you know, because a hundred percent now, you know, it reflects on a lot of people that I know. It reflects on a city. Um, it ref you know, there's the, the stakes are high in my life, but I think that like that that just goes without without saying. I mean, that's the only that's the only thing that I, I feel as far as weight goes. I don't I don't necessarily. But, but the, let's take the Raptors thing. Yeah, uh, you're you're now an, an official ambassador mm -hmm. for the Raptors. Uh, you're 26 years old. Yeah, you're a massive music star. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a lot going on with that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> a new record out that's number one in your touring and all yeah. that. Uh, you could be, you could cheer on the Raptors. Mm -hmm. You could wear the jersey. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the ambassador for the Raptors. Right. Tell me about taking something like that on. Why'd you want to do that? Well, I enjoy new challenges, you know, much like this, this album. I enjoy taking on a challenge. And um, yeah, sure, I could cheer them on and, and wear the jersey, but I'd rather, um, I'd rather revamp the, the, I'd rather, you know, uh, revamp the team, I want to put my input into the building. Um, I want to make it more exciting. I want to make it more fanatic. Uh, I want the energy that, you know, I see when I go, like I talked about college sports or sometimes you'll go to other, to watch other N NBA teams play and it's like you're almost, you feel awkward not being a fan. You got, got to cheer for that team because, I mean, it's just, there's a, an, an electrifying 
energy. I want to bring that here. And it, it, it's just something that I've always wanted to do. So, yeah, I guess just to stand by and like... In put, all of your 26 years. In all of my 26 years. Do you know anyone who's more ambitious than you are? Um, yes, I do. Uh, I Who? Feel, who's more ambitious I feel like I you? surround myself with um, people that are just as, if not more ambitious right. than me. Yeah. Um, you know, my management, um, two guys who I grew up with, um, mm -hmm. friends of mine that uh, have grown exponentially throughout the years and plan to keep growing. I mean, we all do. And th those, those are guys that I feel like at times are, you know, um, more ambitious than me, 40. <laughs> Forty definitely outworked your, your me producer. on this album. Yes, my producer. He's he's um, he's um, maybe my my dreams are a bit more grandiose. But, <laughs> but I was as say, far you're, as you're hardly a slacker. Yeah, yeah. But as as far as ambition goes, I mean, I'm not the only one in, in the in the circle. Well, know? on your last mixtape, so far gone, you wrapped, mm -hmm. and I'm paraphrasing a bit. I want the money and the cars, the clothes and the hose. Mm -hmm. I just want to be successful. We can say hose on here. You should have told me that. <laughs> well, it's your lyric, <laughs> so it's a, it's a proper, it's art. <laughs> yeah. Is that still your definition of success? Um, no, that was, that was very much a, it was always kind of, even at that time, I knew that wasn't the ultimate success. That was just um, the naive young man's, definition of you know like starry-eyed success you know that's that's what that that's what that song was about and I think the verses were the juxtaposition you know the hook was the hook was very much like you said it now that you read it back in your voice it sounds it's it sounds really simple I didn't do a good enough job of it <laughs> but um but no that, that 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 song was always kind of um that that was that is the rap definition of of success I guess so at do that you time, feel like you are successful Yes, I do. I always want more. Um, I'm, for some reason, like ready to go back and start working on new music um, tonight, even though everyone around me needs this a... This came out um, like last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone around me needs a breather for sure, but... Um, but dude, you, you, you said you wanted to have $25 million by the time you're 25. You did that. Mm -hmm. You now you say you want two hundred and fifty million by the time you're twenty nine. I mean, this is given the modest way you grew up. Mm. What what does money mean to you? Well, I think less than the dollar value. It's just more about um, the idea of growth and business business mindset. To you know, twenty five million um, at the time seemed crazy to me but when you start becoming a headlining touring act and you know brands want to get involved with you and you can go do private events and whatnot it's you know you're capable of making it and now I want to you know for sure obviously keep touring keep making music but now I see that there's other ways um you know as far as like you know this global ambassador thing as far as maybe starting i want to invent something i want to i want to start a i want to start a company i want to do something that has maybe nothing to do with music well, I want, why do you care so much about success have you figured that out i'm just addicted to it i just why um i think that i've sacrificed so much for it already and dedicated so much of my time that um, I have to push it as far as I possibly can because I've uh, given up a lot of years as far as um, maybe like nurturing like personal relationships go and, um, you know, trying to build things like a, a family or a relationship or a, I don't I don't like I don't do any of that. I just kind of work. So with that being said, and how do you feel about that? I'm OK with that now. At this point in my life, I'm okay with that. Um, I think it's a great age to be doing that. You know, I think maybe in 10 years, if I'm still in that mindset, I might have to like come sit back down with you and be like, yeah, we got to have it. <laughs> this is a different conversation tonight. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I feel oh, yeah, good about I, it. Now. I, I interview a, a lot of artists who will say, uh, and I'll say, what is the dream here? What do you, you know, I'll say, I, I just want to be able to play music, make a living. Mm. You know, it's just about the art. Yeah. Um, I mean, whether they're being duplicitous or not in the answer, they don't publicly say, I want to be number one, especially right. Canadian musicians. Right. You're not afraid to say that. Mm -hmm. um, tell me why. Well, 
I don't want to be number two. I, I think that would be a weird thing to sit here and say, or I don't care, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to make, I want to make this, this city proud, you know, uh, that, that's, that's a main reason for me. Um, and number one, it takes a while to even become that. I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't even know what number it's, it's like number. I hate numbers, by the way, you know, mm. um, I, I like to say I just want to win, you know. I, it's, it's, it's you know not, that's a debate in Canada, especially with Canadians, is, right? Well, just about uh, uber modesty sometimes, mm. you know. There's the, the, the subtext that we're not supposed to say right. we want to win, you know. Some people take umbrage at the own the podium campaign for the Olympics. It's too much. You know? Maybe that's what I got from my like summer times in Memphis. Then <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've also said you want to write classic songs. So the song, and before I let you go, the song mm -hmm. "Hold On, We're Going Home." You said you want a, a, you want to write a classic song that people will play at the weddings. Mm -hmm. um, that is a contemporary song. That's right. something that is written today. Do you think you've done that? Yes, I think I think that that song is the closest I've come to it. And the reason I say that is because um, there's there's lyrics in there that obviously resonate with people, young, old, and I've seen it. You know, people come up to me and say, like, "That's my song," and my four-year-old loves it. And like, you know, I played it for my dad, and he's sixty mm -hmm. something. And he, it, it definitely is my. You know, it, it it spans the widest as far as any of my songs go. Um, and there's no profanity. You know, that's a big thing, man. Like, that's that changes a lot. You know, it, it, I, I rap, so and I'm 26, so I'm still ready to be young and hungry and you know talk my. I can't say, you know, just talk my game. But there's something to be said for the fact that that is, that is the brand of music that really resonates with the world, you know? So to find the balance, to have that song on this album is actually like one of the mo best moments for me. It, you yourself have this incredible mus musical lineage, not, not just your dad. You're related to Teeny Hodges mm -hmm. and, and, and Willie Mitchell, who helped Al Green yes. make some of the best uh, R&B tunes in the 70s. Yes. Willie Mitchell produced all of the best mm -hmm. Al Green records. He wrote some incredible songs, yep. Let's Stay Together. Yep. Uh, Teeny Hodges co-wrote Take Me to the River, Love and Happiness. It's mm -hmm. an amazing lineage. Yeah. Uh, serious musical chops in your family. Yeah. Do you care about legacy? Do you want to endure the way their work has? Do you think about that? 100%. Um, I think I'm building my own legacy uh, as, as much as I have respect for the gentleman in my family. You know, I think I've, um, I think I've surpassed um, a lot of people's expectations. And I think I'm building my own legacy for my own family one day. You know, um, I, I grew up knowing a lot about that um, side of things, but I didn't like, you know, I didn't necessarily come up off that. I didn't receive any like help or support, you know, from, you know, those people. They're just in my family. So I look forward to building my own, my own lineage, my own legacy with, with, you know, whatever I do moving forward and, you know, whoever I bring into this world. But it is, it is incredible to sort of come from that. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I care about how long it lasts for sure. I'm, I'm in it for the long run. If the career of Drake, uh, one day is a book, a full career in a book. What chapter are we in? Oh man, how many chapters are there? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say there's ten chapters. <laughs> um, we'd be, we'd be, chapter four. Uh -huh. Yeah, chapter four. Um, What's the chapter called? Nothing was the same. It's great to have you here, man. Yeah, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Yes, sir.